The League of the Genuine Show is back. Uh, this time we are having a discussion uh, with an expert in brand protection, brand security. Uh, as you know, uh, a lot of the products that we have on the market that we say are counterfeited have owners. And these owners uh, are the brands, uh, in technical terms, they are the intellectual property owners. Uh, so we are happy uh, for this episode uh, to have uh, in our presence uh, a gentleman, a friend, uh, a good African who has done tremendous work over the last decade uh, in trying uh, to fight counterfeits on behalf of the brands, uh, not just in Uganda, but in many other countries uh, in Africa. Uh, so join me in uh, welcoming uh, Mr. Solomon Oyebode Wilson. Solomon, you're welcome. Thank you, Fred. Uh, your name, Oyebode, sounds like you're from some part of uh, Africa. Where are you from? Yes, I'm proudly from Nigeria, you the are, western part of Africa. You are But from I would Nigeria. rather prefer to refer to myself as an African. So you are not a Nigerian, you are an African? Yes, I'm an African. An African, wow. <laughs> yes. he's, he's a Pan-African. Uh, Solomon, uh, this gentleman uh, happens to be visiting uh, in Uganda, which is his part-time home. You actually work in Uganda and which other country? I work in Uganda, I work in Tanzania, and um, in the Eastern African country, I cover both countries. And in the Western part of Africa, I cover Ghana and Nigeria. Um, I'm doubting whether you, you are an African from Nigeria. I have been to Lagos, I was last there in uh, 2019, and I think uh, Africans from Nigeria are some of the loudest. But now Solomon here, his voice is, uh, you're more Ugandan Nigerian. Uh, are you sure you, your voice is Nigerian? Yes, I am proudly a um, typical Nigerian, probably because of my work um, outside the shores of Nigeria over the years. I have a blend of several cultures that have adapted and assimilated. So that's why your volume went down a yes, bit. Yes, that's why my volume went down. Each time I go back to Nigeria, I also find Nigerians to be very aggressive and loud compared to other African countries, but that's what makes us tick. That's I what actually makes us like, Nigerians. I actually like the, 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 the spirit. Uh, everywhere I have traveled, I have met with Nigerians and they, they are present. Yes. Whether it's in the waiting lobby uh, of, uh, of an airport, if the flight doesn't come, be sure if there are Nigerians on that flight, <laughs> they will go and hold up the, <laughs> the, 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 the airline crew or airline staff, what is <laughs> happening. You know, they are always, and this is, I think, uh, what we need if we are to fight counterfeits. Uh, we need to, to stand up and be counted. Uh, and it's, it's a pleasure that we have uh, uh, Solomon here, who, who is an African from Nigeria, to discuss this topic. Uh, Solomon, you are a lead investigator and CEO of Clapper House. Yes. Uh, ca can you just tell us what Clapper House does? Yeah, Clapper House is a brand protection agency as well as an uh, intellectual property investigation firm. Um, we, we undertake um, uh, intellectual property infringement investigations for a whole lot of brands that hire us to conduct such investigations. And we also, by extension, um, offer digital forensics and criminal investigation in the private sector. That means we major in commercial investigations. So we, I, for instance, I am a criminologist. I am a graduate of criminal investigation and digital forensics, but I operate in the private sector. So I support law enforcement agencies where it is needed. I consult for various law enforcement agencies where the need arises in areas of digital forensics, intellectual property What do you mean by digital forensics? Digital forensic is, um, is a novel practice, though it has been on with the involvement of um, cyber crimes and all forms of digital crimes. Um, digital forensic has no clear um, distinctive um, um, interpretation, but it's just the extraction of data from digital device. So, in crimes that are related to computers, that are related to mobile devices, and um, which is actually involving around Africa, right? We have a lot of cyber crime going on across the world. So as a digital forensics, we have the expertise to actually extract information, um, store evidences, um, provide these evidences in court as expert witness, 
to secure um, prosecution for various um, law enforcement agencies. So you actually support prosecution of counterfeit yes, cases? Yes, I support prosecution of counterfeit cases as an investigator. So I can also move to court as an expert witness if the you know, there are various evolving phases of counterfeit across the world. We have online counterfeit as well, as well as we have physical counterfeits that are coming in through various borders. So we undertake investigations of all these um, um, activities in conjunction with the various law enforcement agencies across the countries that we operate in. Yeah, Solomon here is uh, uh, quite a useful resource uh, uh, in this uh, fight against uh, counterfeits uh, because the anti-counterfeit network does not just have operations or offices here in Uganda, but we actually have a presence in Nigeria as well. And uh, Solomon here has uh, been very, very instrumental uh, in helping us to uh, get the registration there. We're trying to get our feet on the ground. Uh, so we're grateful for that. Though in Nigeria, you, you Ato Nigeria asked us to, to change the name, uh, not to use SCN as it were, but still whatever name you gave is, uh, is quite good. So we're looking forward to, uh, to working deeper and deeper uh, with, with the biggest, uh, largest market uh, on the African continent, which unfortunately, uh, Solomon, uh, largest economy, but it's also the largest in counterfeiting. For example, in pharmaceuticals, I know that Nigeria is either number two or number one in faking uh, behind India uh, or Pakistan. Uh, you're also very strong in faking, all the other things. So we hope that eventually uh, you will be number one, but a clean number one. Now, let's go to, you say brand security, brand protection. Uh, we would like to know, what are some of the brands uh, you work for? Okay, across different countries, we work for... In Nigeria, we work for a lot of indigenous brands who are confronted with um, counterfeiting of their products. Across the borders in other countries where we operate in East Africa, for instance, we work for, we've actually undertaken investigations for Unilever. We, what does Unilever manufacture? Unilever manufactures Omo, they have Roikos, um, they have Close Up, but I think the major challenge with the Unilever products are when we, while we were uh, there are major investigators in Uganda and Tanzania where they powder products and these are majorly the Roikos and the Vim. So in Kansas, There were issues there? There were issues there, the, the, mm. the powdered products. So you have, you have high level local counterfeiting of um, Roiko products and as well as Vim. So this, these particular products are not, um, are not imported. They are locally manufactured, counterfeited products manufactured locally by indigenous people. So that was the challenge that we had with Unilever when we were the investigators. Which other brands? We have Ricket Benkizas, the manufacturers of Dito. And, uh, Dito and Jig. Yeah. yeah. And Ricket Benkizas. Yeah, Ricket Benkizas. And for the same product, usually they, we also confronted, yes, with Ricket Benkizas, we have um, uh, brands, Dito, tablets coming into the countries from China as well. But majorly, we also have the Dito liquid that is locally manufactured, as well as the G. So guys are mixing up stuff. And yes, you go downtown. It. Yes, you go downtown in Kisei. You go downtown to the slums, and you have a lot of people in their households um, actually manufactured in these products and using the same bottle. Yes, it's the, the challenge. Out. The challenge we have with the, the Unilever and um, Ricket Benkiza have similar challenges. Similar challenges in the sense that. Their products, their, their containers have been recycled. So when you, it is difficult now to actually d d d detect a, a counterfeit uh, Roiko or a counterfeit Jig or Dittol because the containers are actually genuine containers. Then you also discover that at times the wrappers are actually also genuine wrappers. It is the content that is inside which you cannot assess from a supermarket point of view that. And which you cannot uh, be able to, you cannot have a chance to know whether the content is correct or not until you purchase. Until you purchase. And go and use it. And use it. Yeah, but, but Solomon, here uh, on the League of the Genuine, uh, through yes. the anti counterfeit Network, we, we actually do a lot of uh, on-the-ground investigations. I know you, you also do that. And we know that you work for so many brands, uh, including Procter & Gamble, um, uh, Philips, uh, Casio, and all these guys. Okay. Uh, we knew in advance, because we work with you, that uh, you'd be coming to the show. So we sent, we sent uh, some of our investigators to, to just go randomly on the market, sample some of these products, and then bring them to you, the expert, 
uh, because you have been trained by these brands on how to identify. Yes. And, and for us, we're saying the biggest issue for the, for the consumer out there is how to identify. So I am going to request the, the, the team here to show you just some two or three products okay. that we went and got on the market. Yes. Uh, we have, um, I think we have products from uh, Procter & Gamble. Uh, this is the, the Pampers and the sanitary pads. Okay? Good. So we are dealing with the mothers and the babies. Okay. If you can help us to, uh, can I have uh, for a start, let's have, uh, we start with the babies, I think. Let's start with the Pampers. Um, the ones that, uh, uh, the, the two samples that we got. Now, I need uh, Solomon to, to tell you here that uh, for the Pampers, we actually, uh, our team bought the, the Pampers from two supermarkets, uh, just downtown in Kampala. Uh, there is a supermarket called Quick, Quick Sell. Again, Mawanda Road. This is the, the receipt. Okay. Uh, the products that we are showing uh, Solomon have been bought uh, the, the, the past few minutes. And the product that we have bought uh, from uh, uh, this quick, quick safe supermarket is a pamper, 10 diapers at 7,500 shillings. And uh, we also have another uh, diaper that we have bought from a supermarket called J. Ambi Impex. It's also on Mawanda Road. Our investigators just went to one place uh, on Mawanda Road and they bought uh, diapers there. So we would like uh, Solomon uh, to tell us, uh, and for your information, uh, one of those diapers is uh, 6,900 shillings and one of them is 7,500 shillings. So I would like to assume that maybe the more expensive one is genuine and the cheaper one is fake. Because most people think that counterfeits are, are so cheaper. Are these, pro are these products sourced from the same supermarkets? They are bought from two different supermarkets. Two different supermarkets. One is called Quick Sell Supermarket and it costs 7,500. You can see the price. Is there a price? Yes, 7,500. So is this one is Quick Sell. Okay. And one is bought at 6,900. Okay. You see the price there? Yes. The price appears. So yes. can you help our mothers, our wives, who are going to the supermarket to buy pampers for their children, which of these products is genuine and safe? OK, thank you, Fred. Um, you see, the fight against counterfeit, like I mentioned, is evolving. Counterfeiters from time to time also change their tactics and they also improve on their tactics. From these two products, I can com comfortably confirm that one of these is counterfeit and one of these is actually a genuine product. And maybe I should zero down first on the counterfeit products. Or the genuine. Or maybe the genuine. start with the genuine. Let me start with the genuine product. So the genuine product you are looking at, what's the price there? The price of the genuine product is 6,900 shillings, Ugandan shillings. So that is genuine and That's it's 6,000. 6, it's cheaper than the, the other one. Okay, it's cheaper tell us. Than the other one. Why is that genuine? Now, this is a genuine product because you can look at the color, even the color of the packaging. What is the difference? Maybe somebody may not tell easily. If you look they at all the, look, what color is that? No, this is, this is, can you see that this is a bit lighter and this is a bit deeper? The green, the green is a bit, they're not the same Maybe color. Maybe let them stand in the same. These are not the same colors, you can see. This is sharper. But they have the same kit. All oh, the kids are even different. They are different kids on it. The branding is equally also different. The packaging material is also different. Where is different. the difference? You can see, you have what you call the air here. You get what I'm saying? Air. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. Here you have number one choice. Uh, 
So the genuine should have air. Yeah. So mothers should look out for air. Yes. Now these pampas, not number one choice. You see, at times when it comes to the detection of counterfeit, the brands usually change packaging materials. So most times when brands improve on the packaging material or change the packaging materials, the, the counterfeit counterfeiters remain with the old graphic work. So in this case, while Proton Gamble has improved on their packaging material, the counterfeiters are using the whole packaging. And secondly, if you look at the, the barcodes, this is a batch code. This is a very critical component in manufacturing and detecting of counterfeits. Mm. If you look at the barcode of this product, you can see that the printing is quite clear and distinctive. You can, they are readable. And they are clear, they are clear and numbers. readable numbers. If you look at the counterfeit, it is not clear, and neither did it state the country of... So where is this genuine one manufactured from? It's made from Egypt. It's manufactured made in, in Egypt. Egypt. All, genuine, all genuine pampas and always in Africa right now comes from Egypt. So if you are a mother and you're buying pampas for your child, be sure that they are made in Egypt. Yeah, they are made in Egypt. We don't make pampas in Uganda. No, pampas are not, this made, brand. In, are not made in Uganda. So you can see clearly this one does not even have a made in Egypt, the barcode, expiry dates, and all the indicative production, um, production details are not clear. They are not readable. So obviously this is a counterfeit product. Apart from this... Uh, marks on the packaging on the trade dress uh, is it possible for somebody since you say these are very important the the bar, the numbers here is it possible for these numbers to be machine readable maybe from from your phone is there like an app the barcodes are not readable they have to be punched into the system and the manufacturing companies for them to be able to understand for instance if i get this batch code and it is sent to Procter and Gamble. They will be How do you send it? We, we, we the investigators have access to that. We were able to ret retrieve these and actually now send it into the system in Procter and Gamble. It will be able to demonstrate and determine when was this product manufactured, which graphic material and packaging was used in yeah, the manufacturing. Yeah, but if, if you are in the supermarket and you're buying. If you're in the supermarket and anything? you're buying, what you need to use, you can use the barcode to do a scanning. You can so you scan can the scan if you are in the supermarket, yes, you to can tell scan whether the product is genuine or not. Or not. But first and foremost, you need to download a scanner. You get what I'm saying on the Google Play to be able to to enable you to be able to scan the. Do the you have that scanner on your phone? Yes, I can do. Can you do a demonstration for us to scan both these to see which one is genuine? Please, can I have my phone? Download uh, from Google app. Yes, you go what to Google app. What is it app. called that you download? You download a barcode scanner. It is called a bar, the app is called barcode, barcode scanner. scanner. Yeah, barcode scanner is what you download. Yes. So maybe you will. You can see. You can see the the app is scanning. So you when you when you scan. It will give you... So you have scanned the fake one? I have scanned scan the one. fake one, yes. What results do you get? Now it gives me a code. It gives me a code that I... Let me scan the original one for you and I'll now be able to explain to you in details. You see, this is 704. It has what, what, what message do you get when you scan the original? When you scan the original, you get a code. When you scan the counterfeit, no code appears. What is the meaning of the code? The code is, the co you can now send the code, if you, want, if you want to go further, you get what I'm saying, you can now send the code to Procter & Gamble, and they will confirm if that product is counterfeit or genuine. So you send the code to, uh, the code to where? You when Procter and Gamble. And once you use the or? barcode, the uh. barcode will lead you. Okay. Yes. To to, to will lead to you address to, you to the address send. where you can send it. But usually, when you send a barcode to, when you're trying to scan the counterfeit product, you don't get the code. Oh, I see. So a genuine product, once scanned on the barcode, yes, it will show the code. It will show the code. A fake product, will not once give you, you scan on the fake 
barcode, yes. you will not get any. You will not get any product. You, but you see, you can also go further. Mm. Even when you get the code, you can also go further and confirm if the code is actually genuine. Did you understand? If you get the code, you can still go ahead through the, 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 the app will lead you to a site where you can actually go and confirm that I have code number 078456. You get what I'm saying? I want to put it in the system and find out if this code is genuine or not. You see, we are here talking about pampas for your children and uh, the expert here is saying that there are some fake and there are some genuine. We bought them on the market and I think really uh, the supermarkets in issue here and have some explaining uh, to do uh, if the expert is saying that you're selling genuine no issues but if the expert is saying that your products are fake then you are accountable uh, to the consumers you're accountable to the public you need to explain but so what if it is uh, so what if it is uh, uh, fake uh, the consumers need to understand the mothers I need to understand that there is some danger posed to their babies, the innocent babies uh, who are being wrapped around these fake products. Can you tell us a little bit what are the concerns, the health concerns or otherwise, for, for using the, the, the fake version? Does it have issues? Yes, it does have implications, health implications, because um, we've had reported cases of um, babies being burnt when they use these counterfeit products. Um, there's a lot of allergies, there's a lot of rashes as a result of um, babies using these counterfeit products. And um, it, is, it is very important for the agencies of government to strengthen their enforcement capability and um, ensure that um, the borders are tightened and to ensure that these counterfeits do not infiltrate into the country. And I think the first responder in this um, instance is the customs because they man the border points. And in Uganda, I think, um, compared to other countries, the, the, Ugandan, the, the United Nations Office of Drug and Crime have set up a unit within the customs, which is called the Joint Port Control Unit. I have worked closely with this um, agency in the last few years, and I think they are doing a tremendous um, work. But I think more still needs to be done. In I was area. opening here, and I'm seeing there are a lot of studies uh, and reports uh, mm. on what on how dangerous uh, mm. these this counterfeit, uh, counterfeit pampas yes. can be on the, both the girl child, there could even be reproductive health issues. You're, you're putting uh, the fake pampa uh, on, on your girl child. You don't know whether there are pesticides in there. You don't know what chemical residues are being used. Uh, this can lead to uh, reproductive health issues. It can also affect a boy child. So when you are talking about buying a fake, uh, pamper and giving it to your child. It's not a simple issue. It's not about saving. And, and you've even showed us here that actually the fake ones are more expensive. So, so this is the point uh, which we keep making, that it is consumer information and education that is going to empower the consumer to actually make the decision. Because when the mother is going to buy any of these pampers in the supermarket, the government is not there. The brand security is not there. Uh, the, the LC one of the area is not there. The lawyer is not there. You make a personal decision. But now the problem I have is that why don't you as brand security uh, help the consumer? Why is it that you do not publicize the information about the barcode? People have smartphones. People have Android. Why at least we can be able to save maybe up to 10 or 5% or 15% why don't you publicize this information to, to the consumers and say, please, to check the product, uh, use the barcode and, and the code will come out? Yeah, Fred, I think um, a lot of the brands are actually, have, they've, they've all embraced um, digital technology. And once, this, once these technologies are integrated into most of these products, I think um, the, the... Why is the information coming out? We only see, if you tune TV now, mm. you are going to see... Pampers, Jolly Baby, Nice Sleep, and Happy Baby. You are not going to see information as to why, uh, as to how to identify uh, this uh, product. That leads me to the issue of trade secret. Do you think that the brands are afraid to show the distinguishing features because the counterfeiters will copy? 
But don't you think in not showing the distinguishing features, you are leaving the mothers and the babies exposed? Yeah, not necessarily. Um, when it comes to trade secret, I think um, most of the brands have, um, they have the responsibility to protect their secrets. And when it comes to the fight against counterfeit, I think most of the brands are actually uh, reaching out to the members of the public in some way or the other. One of those is this, um, the integration of digital applications and barcodes and digital solutions and track and trace um, solutions that we have across. Like Procter & Gamble, you have the barcode here. I think this is one of the digital solutions that have been invented and integrated into their products to fight counterfeit. But interestingly, interestingly what, you, what we need to, I think, talk about here is um, counterfeiting is a very sophisticated and organized crime. And most of these brands are confronted with highly sophisticated, highly financed um, counterfeit network across the globe. So this, this show is against it's counterfeit. So don't praise counterfeiters so much. No, I'm not praising them so them. much credit. I'm not giving them for, so much credit. But you see, say, we also have to appreciate how much counterfeit have evolved across, um, um, in the last few years. For instance, when you're talking about the brand trying to protect their trade secrets, you'll find that, for instance, in China, where a genuine manufacturer has the capability to produce maybe 10,000 tons of a particular product. A genuine manufacturer. And you find a counterfeiter has the capacity to turn around 100,000. Because they have the financing, because they have the funds, and most of these funds, you know, come from illicit trade and are reinvested Rotten into Gamble counterfeit. is a, a, a fortune, one of the biggest companies in the world. These are companies which can fund most of the economies in Africa. Yes, certainly, they, yes. Why, all we are saying, don't go into so much technicalities. You just said that, for example, the genuine product has uh, packaging which has air. Yeah. The fake one has number one choice. So why don't you inform the mothers of Africa when they, you change the packaging, yes. just send out a message. Our packaging now has air. Don't buy any pamper without air. It is as simple as that. In a, an instant, you will have knocked out the fakes. But now the mothers of Africa are going buying. You, you are, as a brand, folding your hands and leaving them to, to buy the fake. Yeah, but you see, this, that, if, this information... How sophisticated the counterfeiter is, there is some simple information you can give that can help. Tell us that don't buy any product not made in Egypt. And we shall buy it. That's yeah, our I, I think most of these brands put this information across to the public. But you see, you must also understand that um, counterfeiters target high... They target companies like the Procter & Gamble's, Companies that have fast made moving. fast moving consumer um, products, you know what I'm saying? They will not target brands that are actually premium brands that are so expensive. No. They look for the Procter and Gambles, the Unilevers, the Wicked Van Gizas. Those are the products that are household names that have made their names over the years. You know what I'm saying? So you, we, they try, the brands themselves. Solomon, don't you agree the brands can do more? Yeah, to I help do. The yeah, I do agree that the brands need to do more because of the evolving trends of counterfeit. But as well, I think um, that's why we are there. We are the investigators. That's why they contact That's why, that's why they hire us. Show. That's why I'm on this show. Okay. You understand know what I'm saying? To be able to reach out to the public, to be able to sensitize the public, to work with the law enforcement agents, and to also educate, more or less, educate the public about what they can look out for and how they can detect counterfeit and how they can even re report counterfeit. Solomon, time is going. We have talked about the babies. I don't know, maybe there are babies out there watching this show, if they understand what we are talking. If they don't, the mothers will tell them. But let's talk about the mothers. We also went to the market and found sanitary pads. All right. Okay? And we would like to know whether the sanitary pads that we bought are genuine or fake, so that we help the mothers as well uh, for, for their personal health uh, and hygiene. Okay? Because in the case of the Pampers, we had uh, two different supermarkets selling. But in the case of the sanitary pads, we bought two different products from the supermarket. Still on Mawanda Road, not far from here. The supermarket is called 
JP. Now, from JP, uh, we bought two packs of sanitary pads. Each pack is 2,200. Can you confirm you have the price there? Yes. So, uh, JP Supermarket, this is your product. Uh, we, we just bought it uh, a few minutes ago. I'm sure you have a camera there. Uh, you'll be able to see that this transaction took their uh, place there. Now, can you also uh, take, uh, take us through that product? Uh, which one is genuine and which one is fake? Yeah, thank you, Fred. From my observation of these two products before me. First uh, of all, the packaging. Is from the packaging, I can tell that this product is genuine, and I'll tell you the reason why. And this is a counterfeit product. All Let's genuine, start with genuine. Yes, all genuine um, Procter and Gamble always um, parts have a perforation line for opening. They have a straight perforation line for opening. And if you look at this product, which, I cons which we suspect to be a counterfeit product, doesn't have any perforation. The perforation is where? You can see, this is the opening. I've just opened this now. Yeah. This is the perforation. So there's a blue. There's a blue and a straight line, and there's a perforation. Now I will take you through the analysis. This product has no perforation line at all. So when you open, what happens? No, even before you open, mm. there are other counterfeit products that do have a perforation. But when you open, the perforation does not tear in a straight line. It doesn't have a straight tear. That can also be counterfeit. But in the case of this one, there is no even a single perforation line. By this, uh, sorry, Solomon, uh, we're here at uh, Protea. I think that you can hear a lot of noise. Yes. There is a, a construction site uh, next to where we are. Uh, which is a good thing, but that shouldn't stop our show. Yes. So please bear, bear, bear with, uh, with the noise uh, and for our viewers also. So can you now open, because I see when you open uh, the genuine one, the opening leaves a, a, a straight line. Yes. Try to open the fake. Okay. See, it's going to tear. Oh, it tears, it tears in whatever direction. In whatever direction. Like what you have here, you can see. So the genuine product will tear on a straight, in a straight line, line, even straight line. The fake product will tear in an uneven manner. You get what I'm saying? And to make matters worse, this product does not even have a perforation line at all. What is the importance of the perforation line? The perforation line makes it easier for you to open and even store, close back your products when they are not in use. So it secures Yes, it secures the products and keeps the them product safe. Yeah. That is unused. That is unused in a safer while way. Them. So you see, this is a unique manufacturing technology. You know what I'm saying? That the counterfeiters can probably not achieve because you integrate this into the manufacturing line. But the counterfeiters are going to use all, man all manners of cheap um, technology to package their products and you can just tell that this is a counterfeit product. So it is dangerous. Why is it dangerous? for you to open and leave the sanitary pads exposed? What, what kind of dangers? Of course, number one, the sanitary pads that you have right inside of this, in this one are counterfeit. Number two, when you open them and you leave them open, you are exposing it to germs and bacteria, and you can get infections from using um, sanitary pads that are not well stored in an hygienic and safe manner. So it is a danger for, for, the, for the ladies, Ab what you are absolutely telling them. Absolutely, it is a danger. Is that, that the mere fact that they are using, it's a counterfeit product in the first place, that means the production is not regulated. You know what I'm saying? The materials used are not um, certified. So this, these are the kind of... I am parts. seeing a video here that was online uh, showing uh, the counterfeit sanitary pad operation uh, somewhere. Uh, in the U.S., I think, it left many concerned about their health. And when you look here, the, some of the, some of the, the, the effects uh, of, of the fake sanitary part, again, what we are talking about, mm. uh, it, it not only just inconveniences the, uh, the lady, but it can lead to 
to burn, uh, it can lead to infusion of uh, toxic material Materials, yes. uh, into the, the woman. Similarly, what you have with the pampas. Uh, health, uh, and, and it can also, there are also some, uh, they mentioned here, and this is quite dangerous, they mentioned that some of the uh, chemicals or materials used have uh, active carcinogens, cancer-causing agents. Uh, agents. Uh, so, ladies out there, uh, it matters a lot what kind of sanitary pad, where you're buying it. Um, the popular brands, as Solomon is showing here, uh, sometimes uh, <coughs> get people trying to duplicate. But again, here, I'll, I'll throw it back to you as, as uh, brand security and protection. Uh, we need this information out there to be given. I think at the, can you train maybe the, the supermarkets or uh, can you as part of your advertising and promotion of these products give, give the, the ladies information and say please do not buy uh, this kind of product buy the genuine because we do not know uh, the connection between the increasing cancer cases for example uh, cervical cancer and all these things coming from the fakers yes. uh, and that leads me to, to the to the next point uh, uh, Solomon uh, don't you think uh, there is a link uh, between these counterfeiters oh. and the terrorists, for example? Because you can imagine this is a product that you put out in the market. Uh, I'll tell you as a lawyer that with terrorism, you have uh, an element of indiscriminate injury and harm. Oh. You put such a product on the market, we have 30, maybe 30 million uh, uh, women, maybe 10 of them uh, use, use uh, sanitary pads. Uh, and you are putting a product that can harm millions of people. Don't you see a link between counterfeiting and terrorism? Yes, it's already documented. I think it's well documented that um, there is a link between um, counterfeit and terrorism across the globe. Um, uh, we have different terrorist groups across the world. We have um, the Islamic State, <laughs> Islamic State in the regions of Turkey and Syria have turned themselves into, into a multinational company and they are in full-fledged counterfeit trade. You see, you will discover that, you see, we have to look at banking, we have to look at financial institutions, we have to look at terrorism, and we have to look at counterfeit. All of these three are quite integrated. There was a time when even before the, okay, let me, before the advent of the bombing in Kenya and Tanzania of the U.S. embassies, there were a lot of NGOs that were operating in these countries that had a lot of funds and were pushing these funds into financial institutions. Until the advent of um, Osama bin Laden, I think right now, I think Kenya and Tanzania has done a lot of cleanup of these NGOs because these NGOs put money into, NG, into banking finance and most of this money end up in terrorism sponsorship. So it has been documented across the globe. Islamic State has products that they deal in. FAC in Colombia deals in counterfeit. Because most of these to agencies... To fund their operations. Yeah, most of these agencies now, because of the clampdown, are self-financing terrorist group. So they have to engage in enterprises to sustain themselves. And the easiest and most lucrative and less punitive um, business and enterprises they can engage in is counterfeit production and distribution. So, Solomon, are you saying that anybody out there who buys this pamper is financing could terrorism. actually be financing terrorism yes, that to is hit a, them. That is a direct implication because, you see, all the, I, like I mentioned to you, is it Hamas, is it Hezbollah, is it Boko Haram in Nigeria, they are involved in counterfeit, they are involved in smuggling. They don't operate a hotel like this. No, they don't. Business. They don't. You see, that is the easiest way to move money around, pretending that it is genuine money. Let me take you back to 2015, the Paris attack. The Paris attack. Kucha. He was involved two years before then he was arrested at the port importing fake Nike trainers into Paris. But he was let the go. Terrorist yes, was the terrorist was actually engaging yes. in he was actually engaging um, selling of counterfeit selling of importing and selling and distribution sports, of counterfeit sports, sports, sports. Yeah. Nike to be particular. So the, 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 the Paris attack of January, November 15, 2015 all the perpetrators and all the key suspects in those crimes were actually Involving counterfeit trade. So it even is in Nairobi, the information I got was that uh, the attack in Dasani Hotel, yes, in Nairobi, 
uh, those guys, uh, uh, the investigations revealed that uh, they were actually trading in uh, uh, Royco, these small cubes. Cubes of Royco. Yes, I have actually done, I have, I, have, um, I have been an investigator for Unilever, and I've actually seen how the Royco cubes are being smuggled from Uganda back to Kenya. You know what I'm saying? And who are the perpetrators? Who are the stakeholders in the trade in contraband and counterfeit Royco? The section of these people are those who probably have links with most of this terrorist group. So it is well documented across the globe that most of the terrorist organizations that we have are linked and are involved in counterfeiting. And so, that's the enterprise. So what you are telling the viewers mm. is that, you know, one time we were talking about some product and there were some online comments, oh, you people, you're spoiling people's business and so on. This is a national security issue. This is a public health issue issue yes this is a national economy issue yes because not only do you lose money when you buy the fake product directly you lose that money because you're not getting value for money but you also lose money to treat the disease that comes out of the use of the fake product yes and if you become sick you also lose money because you may not be able to work so there's a lot of uh, economic there output that economic is lost. Economic issues, that are there's health implications. That. So uh, this issue, uh, what, what is it, because you've been at this for more than a decade, yeah. what is it that you can tell the viewers out there to, to, to pay more attention? Because see, most see. African viewers, uh, and unfortunately you contribute to the content. Nigeria contributes a lot of content. Many people may prefer to go and uh, watch a Nigerian soap or something but not come, uh, and especially the ladies, but not come to a show like this to be taught about the fake sanitary parts. Fred, you see, How uh, do we do the mindset change? See, before I go into that, let me take you back. You see, there are four, um, the link between counterfeit and uh, terrorism eh, has, is based on four points. They are based on four points. The number one, let's look at, is operational. You see, there's increasing cooperation between one terrorist, yes, cooperation between one terrorist group and another. And usually, what is that cooperation? Trade. What brings them together? The association, the cooperation, essentially around the domains of counterfeiting, smuggling, and piracy. So it's money, basically. Yes. The motive is money, profit. No, they have different ideologies. They might have different goals and objectives, but there is a singular operational connection between the counterfeit, uh, um, between the terrorist group across. And that is centered around the domain of counterfeiting, piracy, and smuggling. That's where they generate the resources they use in funding terrorism. You discover that ISIS is funding Boko Haram in Nigeria. You see what I'm saying? If it cannot fund Boko Haram in Nigeria, it has product, counterfeit product that it will ship to Boko Haram in Nigeria that Boko Haram agents will sell and generate money and use, use the same money to fund acts of terrorism. So operational... Um, issue is number one. Number two, we have logistical issue. Now, most of the agents, most of the terrorist group have found counterfeit to be a very lucrative enterprise that they can fund. Keep their money there, operate there, and people assume that they are genuine. And they can move their money around through the same enterprise. So you find a terrorist group, let's say, in uh, wherever they could be, maybe in Somalia, Al maybe in Nigeria, Al Shabaab, whatever it could be, a Boko Haram, we get, a, we get, we go to China, manufacture counterfeit goods, ship it to any country, sell it, and get the money. And they actually, so a lot, most of the uh, terrorist um, organizations you find across the world are dealing in counterfeit. They find it to be a very lucrative method of business and moving money around without so much. Um, suspicion and because one it is also less punitive if they are caught you are a lawyer two years at most yes but how many conviction and prosecution have you been able to secure in uganda on cases related to counterfeit how many cases are even reported you reported in and even when the case is reported the brand owner may not come so when it comes the third principle is they're looking at the, is, is ideology they all have similar they may have different goals like i said but they cooperate with each other now. You find ISIS funding Boko Haram. Boko Haram is in touch with Al Qaeda. You see, there is that network. So they have that ideology. Then the number four is financials. 
all of these agencies have turned into self-financing. Which agencies? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this terrorist group have, have turned themselves, they are now into self financings because now they cannot move their bank money into the banks. It becomes suspicious if they have lost sums of money because all sorts of um, measures have been put in place to curtail money laundering and all of that. So the only way they can hide and perpetrate their evil and be able to fund their activities is through count, um, counterfeit production and distribution across the globe. So but, but, counterfeit is a very but, serious... But why is it, because you have, uh, you have done this for many years, I've also done it for more than a decade, mm. why is it that the African government, the, the African regulator, does not see this as a danger? The most we have here, uh, many times you'll see a small press conference, we have caught this, and that's the end of the case. But let somebody shoot somebody here, you'll see the headline for, for a week. Why do we not then treat this like the terrorists they are? Why do you think it's causing that? You see, it's the political will. Yeah. You see, governments across Africa will make political statements. But they're never going to follow up with legislation, with enforcement um, to ensure that counterfeit trade is caught. Most of the counterfeit traders and stakeholders in Africa are also in government. Politically connected. Yeah, politically connected. So you also discover across Africa at times when you go out to carry out enforcement and the agencies of government that are responsible for enforcement are also, uh, there's a lot of political interference that the goods must be released because somebody has. We face all of that across Africa. So until we realize that the issue of counterfeit is not just about the right holder, yeah? or the, the brand, brand owner. owners, you know what I'm saying, of particular uh, intellectual property, but it's an issue that concerns the, all of us and it has economic and health implications. That's the whole us. public. 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, we don't have this, the scale and prevalence of cancer. is not as much as what we have today. In right now in Africa, particularly Europe, if Europe is talking of counterfeit, they are talking of, at times, Gucci. They are and talking handbag. of bags. In Africa, when we are talking of counterfeit, we are talking of what we eat, medicines that we take. But in Nigeria, you guys, you, I have seen open markets selling medicines in the open market like it's effective. Yes, you see, Africa is the destination now for counterfeit goods. I am an African and I feel very pain when I see that my continent is the destination and dumping site, you know what I'm saying, for counterfeit. So I take my work passionately, you know what I'm saying, and try to fight cancer. I lost my own elder sister to cancer. And it could have come from any of yes. this rubbish. Let me give you, you see, the return on investment in counterfeit is much more than drugs and narcotics. But so much attention is given to narcotics and human trafficking and counterfeit is not given the attention that it deserves. If you look at the return on investment in pharmaceuticals, an investment in fake medicine is a ratio of $1,000 in drug. For $1,000, if you invest $1,000 in a narcotic drug, probably you'll get $20,000. In medicine, the investment of $1,000 can give you between 200,000 to 500,000 euros. For counterfeits? For counterfeits, medicines. So Solomon, what, according to you, mm. is the biggest driver of counterfeiting, which is growing so exponentially on the African continent? We have the acronym here of, of Dankani, which, which you have uh, uh, intimately engaged with. Yes. Which do you think of those factors, differentiation, affordability, uh, normalcy, convenience, uh, negligence of brand owners, ineffective cooperation. Which of those do you think is really driving this? Uh, you see, all of those factors you vice. have mentioned are critical and are key. They are all drivers. But let me single out the issue of affordability. In Africa, most of our markets are price sensitive. You understand? And one of the determinants and motivation for counterfeit is price. But we just saw a counterfeit which is more expensive interestingly so you see thing. interestingly you see that is where the return in investment in counterfeit is very high because counterfeiters take advantage of the end users because they still sell the same counterfeit products to you you know what i'm saying as if it's a genuine product you buy it at the price at the same price as the genuine product or even higher in some brands depending on what kind of brands you are dealing with but you see Africa, because of poverty, because of, if you go downtown now, if you tell someone this is 5,000 and this is 10,000, you say, no, I cannot afford this, I'm going to. But Solomon, if you told the lady that this is 1,000 is fake and that is 2,000, but if you use this, which is fake at 1,000, you have a chance of getting cervical cancer and you could be dead in five years. 
and that you will be alive. Do you think that it is the lack of knowledge about the concealed dangers of products like this that is making the people, despite the fact that they are poor, to actually go and consume the fake? Yeah, I, I think, you see, it's a two-way two issue. I think the regulatory agencies also have a role to play. You see, we are not, when, we, when we talk about counterfeits, yes, by extension, we are also looking at um, regulatory infringement cases. Revelative, regulatory infringement cases will come in areas where you have expired products, you know what I'm saying? Products that are not labeled, products that do not have expiry and manufacturing dates. How do all these products get into the market? You want to ask yourself now, this is a counterfeit product. Number first and foremost, how did this product get into the country? And this product got into the country and paid taxes. And paid taxes. How do you balance public health and the need to collect public revenue? Yeah, you see, that's one of the critical challenges that we are looking at. Government needs to come up with policies that will also favor uh, the traders as well. At times, you see the traders, we say, okay, fine, if we go to China and we import even the counterfeit, that we'll pay high taxes. You know what I'm saying? The, 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 the inspection uh, fee is very high for counterfeit goods. I think government and all the stakeholders need to come together and have a dis channel a discussion and have a discussion regarding how we can mitigate and, you know, try to reduce on the importation, oh, of, on counterfeit, the importation. of counterfeat. Solomon, counterfeit. Solomon, we need to end, and I'm going to beg for as long as uh, you're still in the country. I know yes. you'll be going out uh, uh, in the couple, next couple of uh, uh, days or weeks. Mm. Uh, I am thinking we might need to have another show so that, because you only talked about one product. Yes. But I know that uh, uh, you have in store several products that you can help our consumers uh, uh, to, to differentiate between the genuine and the fake. But as we end, uh, today we dealt with a product that is found in the supermarket. Yes. Paint a picture for the viewer out there. Are the products in the Ugandan supermarkets safe for us to buy? Because many of us want to go to the supermarkets. Uh, we feel that is where you will find legit products and good products, but we've just got this from the supermarket. What do you know about the Ugandan supermarkets and genuine products? Have you caught any fake? Yes, in a pocket of um, places we've been able to detect counterfeit um, in the market. I think what most of the brands need to do, and in partnership with the regulatory um, institutions in Uganda, is to streamline the supply chain. Because, you see, once... UNBS says about 60%, 55 of products in the supermarket are fake. I think they are correct. I think they are correct. And there's a lot to do in that regard to be able to clean the supply chain of most of the ma major products. And I think Uganda Revenue Authority, Customs, also have to improve their capacity to be able to detect counterfeit, especially the jump point control unit. They are doing so well, but I, I hope they can be supported to do more in terms of detection, in terms of working with various um, agencies of government, and um, without political interference, without because this political. has yes, this has huge health implications, and um, we also affect health budgets of each of these countries in Africa. That we are all we always especially in an area where we are struggling with a pandemic, and we also have people consuming products that are unhealthy. So, so you are fighting COVID, then you are fighting infections from uh, from pampas that yes. that fake pampas toxicity there. You are fighting infections from sanitary parts. How will you defeat COVID? Fred, the reality is in Africa, we eat counterfeit, we drink counterfeit, we sleep counterfeit, we, breathe. we wear counterfeit, we breed counterfeit. All the products, everything we use, we encounter counterfeit in every sphere and to make of our it daily worse, existence. We are so ignorant about this fact, yes. or if we are aware, we are so committed to doing nothing about it that we, as you said, remain a dumping ground. People come here to make maximum profit for maximum harm against yes. we, the Africans. And we think that maybe some white man will come and save us. And, that's and you see, the, funny enough, on the side of the brands at times, you see Africa is not a market or certain countries are not the market, they actually consider very important because they feel that the volumes of their products that are going there is not significant. So if, even if you wear, you report a counterfeit product, they do not bother. Because you're a small market. Because you're a small market. Malaysia or Vietnam would have 
Brazil will have bigger uh, concerns to the bottom line yes. than Anyway, we need to stop here. Solomon, I'm hoping that uh, we shall be able to discuss some two or three more products uh, because this, this has really been uh, extremely, extremely important uh, for our consumers because the feedback that we get always is that uh, tell us more, tell us where to report, tell us how to differentiate, tell us where to buy. Uh, I think just right here uh, we've had uh, uh, a good discussion on, on two products of Procter & Gamble, uh, an agent, a uh, brand security agent for... Uh, for Procter & Gamble in the name of uh, Solomon, uh, an African who was uh, born in Nigeria. Thank you so much for, for Thank making you for the for, time. For We'd also like to thank uh, our viewers uh, for supporting us. Uh, the, 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 the viewership is, is growing. This show is not even a year. Uh, but uh, please, uh, when you watch, share, li learn to share, learn to, to like, uh, learn to subscribe. Uh, we depend uh, on that support to be able to uh, bring people like uh, Solomon here uh, to produce for you. So until uh, the next episode uh, of the League of the Genuine, uh, which hopefully will be still with Solomon, uh, we'll need to sign off uh, and say that uh, uh, don't be fake, buy and sell only genuine products.